to fit your horse's needs. And just kind of to, to go along with that, the picture there is from yesterday. And that's my 35 year old who is now, uh, he's got Cushing, Cushing. So I am managing PPID. He's missing most of his teeth. He doesn't do well, doesn't really eat much. He eats his hay, but he gets nothing out of it. So yeah, there are ways to manage most horses. And as you can see, He's looking pretty darn good and he runs out in the pasture thinking I'm a young thing and he's just ridiculous. So anyhow, when you're starting to figure out how to feed your horse, you wanna start with some research. Basically um, figuring out, uh, you wanna look at your horse, evaluate your horse to help determine your individual horse's nutrient needs. And these are all things we're gonna go into in more depth, but so you're gonna evaluate your horse, then you're going to evaluate your horse's forage component because we all know that forage is the basis of all equine diets. So you wanna look and see what you have, what's available and what you are gonna feed your horse for forage. Then you wanna recognize and evaluate the feeds and potential applicable supplements that are available to you and determine then the best options that are gonna to work to meet your needs and also your horse's needs. And then finally, you're gonna look and figure out how to manage your horse's total ration for optimal results. So basically feed some of the feeding management suggestions that I have for horse owners, again, to optimize the diet and help make sure your horse is getting exactly what he or she needs. So to start with, we wanna evaluate your horse. And there's a couple different ways, actually more than a couple, there are several ways that you can categorize your horse when you're figuring out who your horse is and what your horse needs. So one of the typical ways that people use to categorize horses is by class or lifestyle or life stage. And you just look at the horse and say, okay, is this a maintenance horse that's doing pretty much nothing for a living but hanging out and looking, looking pretty? or maybe a growing horse, a breeding horse, mare or stallion, a performance horse, senior horse that no longer can really utilize, uh, for instance, hay in its diet. Now, of course, your horse may be a combination of those because especially if you're dealing with uh, thoroughbreds off the track, you may have a three-year-old that is a growing horse as well as a performance horse. Sometimes you have performance horses that are also breeding horses. Uh, I've got to tell you, my dog is joining in here. So I'm giving her a liver treat. Liver, come on, have a liver treat. So she likes to, uh, my, my UPS guy just delivered, I think it's uh, my horse's supplements. So anyhow, uh, again, your horse could be doing more than one thing at a time. So you want to make sure that the feeding program addresses the nutrient needs for whichever lifestyle or combination, therefore. The other thing that a lot of times people don't really think about when they're categorizing and evaluating their horse is horses have different energy needs. And it has to do with the horse's individual metabolism and also possibly their activity factor. But if you've been in horses for any length of time, you know, you've got easy keepers, you've got average keepers, and you've got hard keepers. You know, the easy keeper, that horse sees an oat and gains a pound. Hard keeper, you feed him and feed him and feed him, and it's really hard to even cover up those ribs. Dealing with thoroughbreds, and I also give riding lessons and do some training, and I've had several clients who have off-the-track thoroughbreds, and very rarely do I find the easy keeper thoroughbreds but sometimes I do. So if you're in the thoroughbred business, they, they cover the whole board. Everybody thinks her, thoroughbreds are hard keepers and sometimes they're not. So you have to, again, look at your own horse and figure out, is this a horse that can pretty well stay, maintain appropriate body weight and condition on forage alone, which would be an easy keeper, or a horse that needs more calories coming from feeds in the diet along with the forage, which is gonna be more of an average or possibly a hard keeper. So to help you identify that, it's really important to be familiar with body condition scoring. So hopefully you all do have some background. If you don't, the body condition scoring is just a system developed 
uh, by Don Henneke and coworkers back at Texas A&M. Um, I think it was in the, in the mid eighties. And it's a way to objectively look at a horse and evaluate the places on the horse's body where they tend to store fat and help again, objectively decide if that horse is overweight, underweight, or just about right. So those six places that you see on the picture of the horse are where horses tend to store fat. You look at each of those six places and you feel and you evaluate the fat cover there and you can determine if the horse, it's, the system runs from a body condition score of a one to a nine, one is poor or emaciated, that is a starving horse. Nine is extremely fat. And those horses, we have really major metabolic concerns. In general, you want to have a horse about at a body, body condition score of five, which is moderate. So a quick way that I use to, to, to look and kind of guesstimate about where that body condition score is going to be is I look over the ribs. And in general, if you can see ribs, the horse is less than a body condition score of five. If you cannot see ribs, in general, that horse is a five or above, but you do want to get your, your hands on the horse because for a five, if you feel over the ribs, you can't see them, but you can feel them just un under the surface. Sometimes uh, you might see a, a performance horse that would get down to about a body condition score of four, four and a half. And in some disciplines, uh, you want to see the horses a little bit more fleshy, more of about a six. However, if you get to a seven or above, again, you can have metabolic concerns. And if nothing else, that's just a lot of fat cover that is dead weight. And if you're working the horse and it's hot and humid, that's actually that fat is an insulator and is not great for a horse anticipating heat. And if the horse is below a four and a half, they actually, if you want to work them, they may not have adequate fuel to support your performance. For brood mares, we do like to see them a little bit fleshier, um, about a six to a seven. Uh, they are more reproductively efficient when they're a little fleshier. But again, we don't really want to see them obese because of problems there. We definitely don't want to see them too thin because when they have that baby and start lactating, their energy requirements skyrocket. And if the mare is thin and has the baby, it's very hard for her to eat enough to support the demands of lactation. So anyhow, that's a body condition scoring. Uh, if, and again, we want to keep them at about a five. And for more information, to learn more about it, if you, if you go to our website, which is ker.com, we do have a very nice body condition score chart that you can look and read through all the body condition scores and figure out how to, how to keep uh, evaluating your own horse and making sure that you keep your horse right about the, the correct body condition. Okay, so you figure out what type of horse you've got going. Uh, what category, the lifestyle, if it's an easy keeper, moderate keeper, hard keeper. You also want to evaluate when you're figuring out what to feed, what forage do you have available? You want to understand not only how much forage you have, but what the quality of the forage. For instance, if you're looking at your pasture access, do you have good grass? Do you have poor grass? What kind of grass do you have? Is a horse getting lots of calories from the grass? The calories you can tell again by body condition scoring because if your horse is getting adequate calories, especially from the forage, it's really not too hard to keep him at about a body condition score of five or maybe even a little bit above. For some breeds of horses, forage at high quality forage or pasture access, uh, the easy keepers, they, they could be fat. And then you need to think about something like a grazing muzzle or uh, limiting their access to pasture. And sometimes you got to even limit their hay. When you're looking at the hay, you want to look at the type and quality of your hay because horses get very little nutritionally out of poor quality hay. They are not as efficient at getting nutrients from hay as, for instance, ruminants. Uh, such as cattle. Cattle can do pretty well on moderate and sometimes fairly poor quality hay, but horses don't. They need, the way their digestive system is set up, they really need good quality hay. So 
You want to be aware of, again, type and quality of hay and the calories and other nutrients provided by the hay. And again, your, your pasture as well. You also want to think about the quantity. Uh, for many horse owners these days, the pasture is limited. There's just land in most places is expensive and people are not using land for pasture grazing nearly as much because there are more profitable ways to use your land. So if your pasture is limited, then you have to even pay more attention to your hay. And in some years, hay can be scarce due to environmental conditions. And also what hay is available may be pretty poor quality. I'm actually located in Kansas. And a few years ago, we had a really bad, bad growing season. It rained and rained and rained all spring. And it just never dried up enough for anybody to get out and cut their hay. And then it rain, 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 the rain quit and it never came back. So then we went right from huge monsoons to drought. And since they didn't get the hay cut while, while, you know, while the rain was going on, by the time that it dried up enough that you could cut hay, the, the plants were all very mature. And so the hay that we got from that cutting was just fairly poor quality because as a plant gets more mature, it gets more fibrous and loses, it has much less protein, uh, calorie, vitamin, and mineral content for horses. So, and we only had the one cutting because then it turned into a drought. So that winter, we were trying to use that hay. First off, again, it was scarce and it was fairly expensive and the horses just got very little out of it. So we found that winter that we were having to feed so much more feed to compensate for the poor hay quality. And as a nutritionist in uh, the feed industry, I'm used to having uh, horse owners call and say, what did you do to the formula of that feed? Because my horses are not doing as well on it as they used to. And my first question would always come back to, have you checked your forage? You know, what's your hay quality? Have you changed the hay? Because going from good quality hay to poor quality hay, your horse will let you know it's going to be so much harder to keep weight on them and keep them looking good. So if good quality forage is scarce, then there are some things to consider. For instance, using a complete feed that has the forage built into the feed. Um, a hay stretcher, which is a basically a formulated source of uh, forage and roughage that can be fed to replace some or all of the hay in the, or, the, or the pasture in your horse's diet. Or there are all sorts of forage replacements. I'm sure y'all are familiar with beet pulp. Uh, beet pulp shreds can be used to replace some of the forage. Uh, there are uh, forage pellets, forage cubes, lots of things you can, if, the, if your hay is scarce or poor quality, and you don't have pasture, there are products to look at. Now, on the other hand, if the good quality forage is plentiful, for instance, it's, it's springtime, the pastures are greening up, getting really nice. And uh, last year around here was a pretty good year for hay. So we've got, we've got good quality forage for the easy keepers. Then you have to think about what's gonna go along with that good quality forage so that you can get the nutrients into them, the protein, vitamins, and minerals that are often lacking in the forage, but you don't want to add so many calories that your horses get too fat. So you might want to look at a ration balancer or a lower calorie feed to prevent excess weight gain along with that really good quality forage or hay. Okay, so we've evaluated the forages, we've evaluated the horses, and so what's the best way then to find the right feed to meet all your horse's needs? Well, you wanna just go shopping? Uh, I, there's a lot of feed stores that you walk in and the plethora of feeding options is amazing. Uh, you can go through and you can be reading feed tags, comparing feed tags, I'm gonna talk about that. You can look at websites because uh, most of the feed companies have websites that you can look and you can see what they say about all the feeds. 
that's really, that's not a bad thing to do, but again, it's a huge amount of information to sift through. I got to say, Dr. Google, that's a really fun one. And I've just got a screenshot. I just Googled horse feeds and that was just, <laughs> all those images are what fit in my one little screenshot. So it can be very overwhelming. There are so many options available. There are a lot of really good options out there for horse owners. They're not all available in all areas. And so I'm gonna give you some ideas of how to sort through and try to find what's gonna fit your horse and your needs. So the first thing though is feed tags, how to play the feed tag game. And I have to say, I'm very familiar with feed tags. Uh, throughout my horse feed industry career, I always end up being the one of the people and working with the horse feed tags. So again, I'm very familiar with them. <laughs> they can be so much fun. Just as an example, when you're looking at a horse feed tag, how do you know what you're getting? So let's say you're dog shopping. And here's, here's an ad that gives you good information about this dog, a professionally trained, affectionate, and a house broke dog that's actually free to a good home. You look at that and say, that's exactly what I'm looking for. I'm going to get that dog. And then this is what comes to your house. Now, I must say, uh, apologies to Elwood. I am sure Elwood is or was a wonderfully sweet, loving dog, but that description didn't necessarily uh, prepare you for exactly what Elwood is or was. Actually, Elwood has passed at this point. So there is a lot of information you might want to ask. And when you start looking at a feed tag, the feed tags are basically legally, uh, they're legal documents that are regulated and they don't, it's not the formula of the horse feed. It's just the legal document that gives you the required description of the feed that's in the bag. So let's take a look at the legal document. And I have to thank the AQHA for their publication that I pilfered this feed tag from. And this of course is a faux feed tag, but it's a faux 12% textured horse feed. But these are the things that you will see on a feed tag. They are regulated by the government. And so feed tags should have all these things. First off, the name of the feed can be named anything you want it to be named. Uh, I, could, I, could, I could formulate a feed and call it Fred's horse feed. That's fine. As long as the tag has the name of the feed. The next thing, which is pretty important though, is the purpose statement. And this is the statement that says who this feed was designed for. So in this case, this, is, this feed was designed for the maintenance of mature horses. You can see uh, purpose statements for performance horses, for growing breeding horses. So there are all sorts of things, but it's, it should give you an idea of what the feed is designed for. Then you're going to see the guaranteed analysis. The guaranteed analyses can be different from state to state. There is a federal, uh, it's not required, but there's federal guidelines that, that the state's regulatory groups can choose whether to follow directly the federal regulations or they can decide on their own. But this is the basic guaranteed analysis and most of the states do abide by the guaranteed analysis. Some of them add some of their own requirements. So after the guaranteed analysis, you see the list of ingredients. We'll talk more about each of these things in a minute. And then after the ingredient statement, you'll see the feeding directions, which you know, just tell you how to feed that feed to your horse. Then some various important statements. Some states require various statements and others don't. And then you're gonna find the manufacturer's information that tells you uh, where or who this uh, feed was manufactured either by or for. So I do have to, this is my favorite feed tag ever. And a friend of mine found this and he was nice enough to share it with me. This was a real feed tag. And I just love this purpose statement. It's not probably exactly what the government was intending, but it's great. Taste good, sweet feed. 
And so the purpose statement is the taste good sweet feed is designed for profitable feeding to the working man's cattle and or his pleasure horse. Do not feed to those hybrid and ultra expensive show cattle or race horses. If you can afford these kind of animals, then ask your dealer about a high priced feed designed for that market. Taste good, Rillas. Thanks again. So y'all, if you've gotten off the track thoroughbred, they're telling you right up front, this is not the feed for you. But still, I just, I love that purpose statement. Okay, required guarantees. Uh, the list here I've got on the slide, these are the current um, guarantees that are required on horse feed tags. So minimum crude protein, minimum crude fat, maximum crude fiber, maximum acid detergent fiber, mass, maximum neutral detergent fiber, minimum and maximum calcium, minimum phosphorus, minimum copper, minimum selenium, minimum zinc, and minimum vitamin A. Now, you'll see a lot of horse feed tags that have more guarantees than this, and there's nothing wrong with a feed company deciding to add more guarantees, but these are the minimum guarantees that uh, AFCO, which is the, the National Regulatory Agency, these are the minimum required guarantees. Now, is that everything you really want to know about a horse feed? Not necessarily. Perhaps you want to know about the calories in your horse feed. That's not gonna be on the tag. The things on the tag need to have analyses available so that those feed tags can be checked to make sure by the state regulatory agencies, they can, they can analyze the feeds and make sure that those feeds are, are meeting their tag guarantees. There's no direct analysis for calories in a feed. So it is not gonna be on a feed tag. Now, most reputable manufacturers will share that information, but sometimes it's a little harder to find. Some companies have the information right on their website. Um, sometimes you can ask the sales rep, you can ask the feed dealer, uh, sometimes you can contact the manufacturer, but it helps to find out how many calories are in that feed. So when you're figuring out what's going to meet your horse's needs, you can, you know, if it's a high calorie feed, a moderate calorie feed or a low calorie feed. Now, carbohydrates, there are fiber carbohydrates, and those are on the tag as maximum crude fiber, maximum acid detergent fiber and maximum uh, neutral detergent fiber. But quite honestly, those maximums, that's a max. That doesn't mean that's the exact amount that's in the feed. And sometimes those numbers are a little bit unwieldy to deal with as, as a horse owner. Quite honestly, unless I'm looking for a feed that's gonna replace the forages, I don't spend that much time looking at the fiber carbohydrates. What I'm more interested in is in the non-structural carbohydrates, the sugars and starches. And the, the law was changed just a few years ago so that if any claims are made about the feed relating to, to non-structural carbohydrates or soluble carbs, if there's a claim, then you have to guarantee the maximum sugar and the maximum starch that are in that feed on the feed tag. Not all feed tags are complying with that change in legislation, legislation at, at the moment, but the feed companies are, the ones that haven't been complying are, are pretty much, as far as I know, moving in that direction. So that's, that's helpful, but again, that's maximum sugar and maximum starch. And if you have a horse that is extremely sensitive to soluble carbs, sometimes it helps to know exactly what uh, the average starch and sugars are going to be in those feeds. And in those situations, it does help sometimes to work with a veterinarian, an equine nutritionist, and check in with the feed company to, to ask for their help in making sure that you're meeting your horse's needs. But again, the actual amounts of carbs are not gonna be found on the feed tags, just maximums on the tags with carbohydrate claims. 
Now, what about amino acids, vitamins, and minerals that are not guaranteed on the tags? Because remember, the only the, none of the amino acids are required to be guaranteed on the tags. Uh, of the vitamins, at this time, vitamin A is the only vitamin required to be guaranteed. And many of the minerals are not required to be guaranteed on the tag. So how do you make sure then that your horse is getting what it needs? Again, you can, you can go to the manufacturer and ask for information. You can work with an equine nutritionist. And a lot of times what you end up doing is trusting in that manufacturer's research. Are they doing research on their own feeds and they make sure that their feeds are meeting horses requirements and of course the integrity of the feed company. So it helps when you're doing your research, do some research on the feed company when you're looking to purchase feed from them. So interpreting the guarantees, those guarantees that are on the tag, if, you are, are, if you're comparing tags, a lot of times um, horse owners start looking for numbers thinking, okay, if this feed has more of this nutrient than another feed, then it's better. Well, not always. First off, how well do the numbers actually meet the horse's requirements? When you're looking at the tag, You've got, you've got the number on the tag, that's great, but you also have to re relate it to the feeding rate. Because if you're feeding a 14% crude protein feed, there's a big difference if you're feeding four pounds a day versus 12 pounds a day. So you have to take how much crude protein or how much of an amino acid is in the feed, multiply it by how many pounds that your feeding of that feed, and then compare that to the horse's actual nutrient requirement to make sure that that nutrient requirement is being met. So keep in mind, these numbers are kind of relative. As a nutritionist, we often look at nutrient to calorie ratios to make sure that when fed to meet the horse's calorie requirements, you're meeting all the other nutrient requirements as well. The other thing to look at is that more is not always better. For instance, this is, this is a feed tag. I, I found this feed tag years ago. I expect this, this feed is probably not even still in existence, but feeds similar are, are still out there. So looking at vitamin A on this feed tag, this feed actually has 9,000 international units per pound minimum of vitamin A, okay? You look a lot of typical feeds and they may have 3,000 to 5,000 I use per pound. So you'd say, well, this one's 9,000. That's gotta be so much better. Okay, well, if I tell you that the horse's maximum tolerable amount of vitamin A in its diet is about 7,000 I use per pound, then maybe 9,000 isn't such a great deal. Now, if it's a complete feed, if it's designed to be fed without anything else in the diet, then 9,000 could get a little scary. Now, if this is a ration balancer that's designed to be only fed one to two pounds a day, then actually 9,000 is kind of minimal. Again, you have to think about the feeding rate. Another thing on this one, vitamin D is 1,000 I use per pound. And for a horse, maximum tolerable amount of vitamin D is 1,000 I use per pound. So again, if this was a complete feed, I'd be a little worried that that's a lot of vitamin D. But finally, and this is what tells you that this is uh, definitely not a ration balancer. The vitamin E is 15 I use per pound. So 15, uh, vitamin E is kind of an expensive ingredient. Vitamins A and D are pretty cheap ingredients. And that should tell you something about this feed because the cheap ingredients, it's got a lot, expensive ingredient, it doesn't have much. And for an 1100 pound horse, the, the maintenance vitamin E requirement is about 600 IUs per day. So that means if your horse is on hay that's probably six months old or older, the vitamin E activity is pretty well gone. So it's really not getting vitamin E from its hay. So you need to assume it's gonna get the vitamin E from its feed. 
for this feed, you'd have to feed 40 pounds a day to meet the maintenance vitamin E. So that tells you something about the feed. <laughs> so as I'm saying about the feed tags, there is information you can glean from the feed tag, but sometimes not as much as you would like. For instance, on a list of ingredients, okay, there, there are, there's all the ingredients in the feed, but that doesn't give you the amounts of ingredients. The feed tags should be, those ingredients should be in descending order of inclusion rate. So the first ingredient should be the, the, the highest level of whatever ingredient that is. Uh, but that's really not regulated because there's, there's, there's really no way to test a feed to see, like especially a pelleted feed, how, how much corn is actually in that feed. You can't test it to find out. If you have access to actually seeing the formula, you would know, but that's usually very proprietary information. So the tag does not give that information on the actual amount of each ingredient in the feed. There's not a lot of regulation on that descending order of inclusion. And keep in mind, the tag is not the formula. The tag is just that legal document. Uh, the other thing that people sometimes get a little confused about is that uh, according to AFCO, in the list of ingredients, they can be listed either as individual ingredients such as corn and oats and wheat middlings, et cetera, or in most states, uh, some states require individual ingredients. Many states allow collective terms. So collective terms would be things such as grains, grain products, processed grain byproducts, forage products, et cetera. And so your, your corn, your oats, your barley are gonna fall into grains. If it's processed corn, oats, barley, it's going to be in grain products. However, processed grain byproducts, and a lot of people get worried about those thinking, ooh, that's floor sweepings. But actually there are a lot of processed grain byproducts that are very good ingredients, such as wheat middlings, People think wheat middlings can be pretty bad, but they're actually a very nutritious ingredient for horse feeds. So if you're looking at a tag and you do see wheat middlings or you do see processed grain byproducts, it's not something to get really worried and scared about and think that this, this is a bad feed. No, there, there, there really aren't magic, new, uh, magic ingredients that are really all bad. There are really not a lot of ingredients that are that are really evil and scary. And now this is one time, I will say in general, you do get what you pay for. And if you want to go with the economy feeds, you may be sacrificing in the quality of the ingredients. But when you go with the really, unfortunately, pricey feeds, uh, the premium feeds, those ingredients usually are very well screened for quality. But of course, the hor your horse is going to be the the best arbiter of the quality of your feeds because when you feed is recommended and your horse doesn't look and perform and you don't see the good results, that may have to do with the quality of the ingredients or the actual formulation of the feed. So the tag gives you some information, your horse gives you even more. So takeaway on tags. Horses have nutrient requirements. They don't have ingredient requirements. Every ingredient brings its own little nutrient profile and it's the nutritionist's job to put the ingredients together so that the finished feed has all the nutrients that meet the horse's uh, requirements. And there are a lot of different ways to use various ingredients to meet those nutrient requirements. And as I said, there, there are no magic ingredients. I wish there were. I would try to find a magic ingredient and I would try to get a patent on that ingredient. And then I would retire and go ride my horses all the time, but have not found any specific magic ingredient. Okay, so if we're not gonna be using feed tags, again, there's some good information, but it's not the be all end all of the world. We're gonna glean some information from the tags. We're gonna, we may look at some websites, uh, but, it's good to be able to evaluate feeds on your own and go through the feeds and say, what is it that I'm looking for in a feed to make the best choice for my horse? So 
just like horse categories, there's some, several different ways to categorize the feeds. There's categories by uh, your horse's life stage lifestyle. And for that, when you're looking at the feeds, you got maintenance feeds, you have growth and breeding feeds. You've all heard of mare and foal feeds because growing horses and breeding mares, you can kind of combine their nutrition and do a pretty good job of meeting the needs for both of those horses. And especially since uh, often babies are eating with their mares, uh, their mothers, you do want to have feeds that work well for both of them. There are also performance feeds. There are senior feeds. And when I talk about a senior feed, I'm considering that's a, a feed for the old guys who are either running out of teeth or have dental conditions such that they're no longer well able to chew and utilize the nutrients from uh, particularly hay, but they may even get to the point where my 35 year old, he's not even getting all that good from the grass. So those are complete feeds with the forage or roughage added. And then we got some all purpose feeds that really, if, if, if you're careful about formulation, they can take a horse from basically uh, weaning, well, even creep feed, weaning through growth. Uh, you can feed them to the breeding horses, performance horses, all the way up to the point where they need a complete senior feed. So those are what I consider all purpose feeds. And then the ration balancers, which are the very concentrated feeds that you can feed in small amounts. It's like 30, 32% protein, somewhere in that range, and then concentrated vitamins and minerals. So you can feed one to two pounds a day for most mature horses and get all the protein, vitamins, and minerals that they need that they're not necessarily getting from the forages. But when you're only feeding one to two pounds a day, they're also not getting a lot of calories from that very small feeding rate. So for easy keepers, it's a good way to meet the nutrient requirements without you know, cascading that weight, weight gain. So another way though, to evaluate the feeds is the caloric density. You know, how many calories are in that feed? And along with that too, you may wanna look at where the calories are coming from. So on my slide, I just talked about the low calorie, which some feeds are actually formulated to have very low calories or the ration balancers um, fall into that category. Moderate calories, a lot of the all-purpose feeds will fall into the moderate calorie so that because a range of feeding rates can be uh, pretty, pretty wide in those. The high calorie feeds, that's usually going more for the performance horses because those horses have very high calorie requirements. And then the complete feeds are actually usually a little bit lower calorie because forages and roughages tend to have lower calories. And those feeds are designed to be fed at very high feeding rates. Because if a horse in general eats about 2% of its body weight per day, uh, dry matter, which means uh, about 20, perhaps 25 pounds per day of, of hay to maintain you know, to maintenance, light work. If the horse isn't eating hay anymore and you've got to replace that with a complete feed, dry matter basis, you're talking about you know, 18 to 20 pounds of feed. So those are going to usually be a little bit lower to moderate calories because if you're feeding 20 pounds of a high calorie feed, you're going to be dealing with obesity. So you look at the caloric density. And as I said, you can look also at what is supplying those calories. Is that a high fat and fiber feed that a lot of the calories are coming from fats and also fermentable fibers? Or is it more of a grain-based feed? A lot of racehorses, a lot of thoroughbreds are on uh, more of the sweet feeds, the grain-based feeds. And a lot of those calories are coming then from starch and sugars. I don't want to say that calories coming from starch and sugars are a bad thing. They've gotten a really bad rap in recent years, but that's a very important source of glucose, which is a very, very, or the primary fuel required by performance horses. So a lot of people are getting scared of starches and sugars in horse feeds, but you got to have some starch and sugar in your horse's diet for the horse to be able to perform at all. So you can look though for different horses, 
There's also the thought that starch and sugar might make a horse more active, a little bit more hyper. If you have a horse that you feel responds that way, you might wanna to go to a feed that has, is a little bit less grain-based and a little bit higher fat and fiber. If you have a horse that is a little dull and you think that a little bit more starch sugar in the diet may pep it up a bit, you can give that a try. I personally haven't had horses that I've seen much of any difference uh, in looking at fuel sources. So I'm not gonna say that that's, that's not true. I think it, it's, a very, it's possible that that's very true for some horses, but not all horses. So anyhow, that's just a different way to evaluate feeds. And on the feeds that I've got on my slide, I've got the all phase, which is a ration balancer. So it's low calorie. Then I've got several performance feeds that are either grain-based or pelleted, high fat, high fiber. And they're, they're all appropriate for performance horses, just depends on the individual horse. And then I've got uh, some kind of all-purpose feeds that are kind of moderate calorie. And then we've got some complete feeds. And uh, again, the complete feeds often are appropriate for the senior horses. So that's another thing when you're talking about calories, if it's not uh, easily found, that information is not easily found, check with the manufacturer. And I will say going from manufacturer to manufacturer, you may not always be talking apples to apples when you're talking about calories. You may be doing apples to oranges because it's, it's hard to measure the calories in a feed. And so feed manufacturers kind of develop their own ways. But if you're looking at different feeds within that manufacturer's line, that should give you a relative idea of these are the higher calorie feeds, these are moderate calorie feeds, these are the low calorie feeds. When it gets right down to it and you're trying to figure out what to feed your horse, uh, exact numbers are, aren't always necessary. If you get in the ballpark and then you watch your horse and you body condition score your horse and you watch your horse's top line, see their muscle development, watch your young baby's growth, these are the things that you can use to evaluate how your feeding program is working for your horse. So putting all that information together, what's the best fit for your horse? At, look at the, cat, put the categories together. So these are my examples. Let's say you've got a growing horse that's an easy keeper. Okay, you need to have the protein, vitamins, and minerals to support growth. But if you've got an easy keeper and you don't want that baby to get fat because you increase a risk of developmental problems when you let the baby get too many calories and get fat. So maybe it's a growing horse with an easy, that's an easy keeper. You might want to look, you look at a ration balancer like the KER all phase, because again, one to two pounds a day for, uh, in, in general, for a yearling, I actually, for a big yearling, I may be actually going up to about three pounds of ration balancer, but that's a good way to get the nutrients in without a whole lot of excess calories. Let's say you've got a performance horse that's a hard keeper. Then you want a performance feed that does have a lot of calories in it. And so that's where a, a high fat and fiber feed may be appropriate or a grain-based feed that's got more fat because fat is a very dense calorie source. So again, that, that kind of points you in the direction of the feed you might want to pick. Or if you've got one of those a multi-purpose, a growing performance horse, that's an average keeper, depending on the level of performance, you might want to use an all-purpose feed that's kind of moderate in calories, but has the protein, vitamins, and minerals to support all sorts of different things. Again, if you've got a, a growing high-performance feed, quite honestly, in that situation, it's usually, if it's a thoroughbred, it's probably not going to be an average keeper. So in that situation, you would be wanting to look at a higher calorie performance feed that's very well fortified to support growing horses and those feeds are out there and available. So you determine which feed or feeds are most appropriate for your horses. And again, help is always available. You can check with your manufacturer. A lot of times the feed dealers have people that are willing to help. Um, a lot of good sales representatives are out there. And uh, I gotta say, Kentucky Equine Research is happy to help. 
I will talk a little bit more about that later on. I'm not going to talk a whole lot about supplements because, oh my, you look at some of the, the catalogs of with supplements and my head just explodes. There's so many supplements out there, but I... I, I categorize them as nutritional supplements and then non-nutritional supplements. And the nutritional supplements are uh, things such as, they're, they're typical nutrients that need to be in the diet. And a lot of times, if you're feeding an appropriate feed or a ration balancer, the nutrients are already in your ration and you don't need an additional nutritional supplement. Now, if you don't want to go the ration balancer route and you're just uh, deal, you've got a horse that's maintaining body weight and condition on forages alone, then you want to uh, look at at least, if you don't want to do the ration balancer, at least a good quality equine vitamin mineral supplement to make sure that the horse is getting everything. The forages, the forages are usually lacking in some of the vitamins and minerals. So in that case, ration balancer or vitamin mineral supplement, but if you are feeding a balanced diet and you start nutrients, you can get imbalances and sometimes you can get excesses. And there are maximum tolerable amounts of, of several vitamins and minerals. And if you start adding more and more, you can, you can get over maximum tolerables. You can actually get toxicities from some, some of the nutrients. So be very careful if you start just adding uh, nutritional supplements. Now, some caveats there, electrolytes or so, just plain salt. Uh, you're not going to get a feed, especially a working horse that's sweating. Uh, a feed and a forage is actually not going to meet the, the sodium chloride. Well, potassium, you may be okay because there's usually a lot of potassium in hay, but sodium and chloride, when a horse is sweating, you, you need to supplement with, with salt. So if nothing else, it doesn't hurt to just have a plain white salt block available in the stall, in the pasture. When the horse is really working a performance horse, you do wanna look at adding a, a good quality electrolyte supplement. I've got uh, pictures of the KER uh, electrolytes that are available that are, are proven in research, well-balanced and excellent electrolyte supplements. Now, amino acids, especially for performance horses, there are times that amino acids may be helpful to supplement. And the nice thing with electrolytes, amino acids, and for the most part, antioxidants, those are all nutrients that it's really hard to go overboard on. They're, they, uh, things such as, well, sodium chloride and vitamin E, it's difficult to get so much that it's going to be a problem. And uh, amino acids as well. We've also seen some of the horses with muscle myopathies, adding specific amino acids can be very helpful in managing these situations. So a good amino acid supplement, such as the KER MFM pellet, can be very helpful in situations that warrant. And then antioxidants, there are a lot of times that vitamin E uh, is deficient in forages, especially fresh pasture is a great source of vitamin E, but as soon as that, that grass is cut, it starts losing vitamin E and vitamin A activity. And so there's, there are many times that adding some vitamin E, especially for a performance horse or a horse that's on a year round hay program can be helpful. And one of the, the, the best source of vitamin E is natural vitamin E. It's the most bioavailable. And an aqueous solution of natural vitamin E is the most bioavailable form of vitamin E. So KER's Nano E is an excellent antioxidant to use as a supplement. And then also for high-performance horses, and perhaps a lot of those, these horses that are, develop various muscle myopathies, Another antioxidant is um, the, the coenzyme Q10, and that is also available as a supplement. So there are situations when nutritional supplements may be warranted. Again, there's specific situations to be aware of, and in those situations, you do want to make sure you have a good, balanced, research-proven supplement that's going to work because 
why spend money on a supplement that's not going to do you any good? They're, they're not cheap things to add to your horse's ration. Non-nutritional supplements to address specific, specific conditions look to the research to find evidence of efficacy. There are so many non-nutritional supplements. And if it's no good, and many of them have no research evidence indicating they're doing anything, some of them don't even get absorbed in the small intestine or in the entire digestive tract. And if you're feeding a supplement that doesn't even get absorbed, you're just spitting in the wind and throwing your money away. So again, look for the research. Some of the supplements are, are very effective and can come in certain stations if your horse needs them. So digestive aids, if your horse has a risk of gastric ulcer, has a risk of colic, there are some really good digestive aids that can help. Oral joint supplements, if you and your veterinarian feel that you're seeing benefit from an oral joint supplement, make sure it's a good one that the ingredients listed are actually in that supplement because supplements are not a well-regulated uh, whole uh, industry. So there are supplements out there that what it says should be in the bucket or the bag or whatever, it doesn't even meet its tag requirements. So just be aware, do your research. If you're gonna use a supplement, make sure it's, it's a good supplement. Calming supplements, not a big fan. There's not a lot of good research indicating calm, calming supplements are of much benefit. Prebiotics, probiotics, et cetera, that they, they very rarely do any harm. If you and your veterinarian are feeling that you're seeing a, a benefit from prebiotics and probiotics, usually such, uh, especially the prebiotics, your feeds and your forages contain a lot of prebiotics substances. But if, if you feel that it's helping your horse, again, that's one that's, that's very likely not to harm your horse. Okay, so you've gone through and you figured out all these things that you want to put in your horse's diet. Now, how to get them in your horse. How best to manage your horse's total ration for optimal results. This picture is not a good indication of how to do it because your horse does not have the nutritional wisdom to pick out and eat the things that are good for it. For instance, if you've got grain and hay and vitamins and minerals all, all sorted out, your horse is gonna eat all the grain first, then it's gonna eat all the hay and it's gonna leave the vitamins and minerals and maybe never eat them at all. So horses don't do it well on their own. How much should you feed? Okay, look back at the feed tag because remember the feeding directions, we really didn't talk about that. And to me, this is where I usually spend most of my time on a feed tag is looking at the feeding directions because that tells you how much you need to feed to actually meet your horse's nutrient requirements. And a lot of times there's a minimum amount of feed for traditional feed, uh, formulated feed. For It's, it's usually about 0.4 to 0.5 pounds per 100 pounds of body weight, minimum to meet the nutrient requirements. So a thousand pound horse for a typical feed, you need to feed four to five pounds uh, per day to get the nutrients that they need. Okay, so this is actually a, a pretty extensive feeding chart for um, a horse feed. This is a performance horse feed. And you see at the top of the feeding chart, it says minimum hay or equivalent pasture in pounds per day. So it starts with your forage. And, but, but wait, do we have all the information we need? What about the weight of the horse in pounds? I keep talking about, you know, 1,000, 1,100 pound horse. Well, how much does your horse weigh? Because research has shown that eyeballing body weight is not reliable at all. Uh, so if you have access to a livestock scale, you really know that's how much your horse weighs. If you don't have access to a livestock scale, you could use a body weight tape. There are several out there available and they'll at least usually get you in the ballpark. Or you can use a body weight equation. Uh, in general, the one that's used is heart girth times heart girth times body length divided by the magic number 330. That'll get you in the ballpark of your horse's body weight in pounds. But if you know your horse's body weight 
and you know the body condition score, so you know if your horse is thin and needs to gain weight or fat, needs to lose weight, or just write that body condition score around five, then you can go back to your feeding chart and say, okay, I have a thousand pound horse. It needs at least 12 pounds a day in hay. And my horse is at moderate work. So that in this feed is going to be about seven and a half pounds a day. Now, if you're feeding more than 12 pounds a day of hay, you can probably back off your feed a bit. Uh, the, the 12 pounds is the minimum. So hopefully you're not feeding less than that. But that's where, you know, eyeball, well, I say eyeballing, no, don't eyeball your horse. Body conditions for your horse, use your weight tape or your uh, equation or maybe your livestock scale and feed. And then you can adjust up or down a little bit to make sure your horse is uh, where you want them to be. So let's say you're going to feed that seven and a half pounds of feed a day. How much feed is that? Okay, I'm showing my age because this is still my favorite tool for measuring feed. It's a three pound coffee can, which you can't get that cool Folgers three pound coffee can anymore. However, does that coffee can actually hold three pounds of coffee can? Because no, it does not. It holds well, 2.8 uh, pounds of coffee. So how much feed is that? And today people don't even use the coffee cans anymore unless you're old school like me and still have one hanging around your barn. So we use scoops. Okay, how much feed goes in your scoop? Because this is my collection of scoops. I, and I have been on barns. I was at a barn that the scoop was a coffee mug. And I was at another barn that the scoop was a five gallon water bucket. That's a lot of difference in feed. So the point is feed by weight, not volume. Whatever tool you're using, whether it's a coffee can, a scoop, whatever, doesn't matter. Put the feed, well, first put, put your tool on your scale and tear it, zero it out, and then put your feed in it and find out how much feed in pounds is actually in your scoop of feed, because it can be very different depending on the feed and actually depending on who scoops it out. Because different people scooping the, the, the scoop, they may think a full scoop is heaping or somebody else thinks the full scoop is about a half an inch below the top. So if you weigh, you know how much feed is going into that horse's feed pan. And the other thing to weigh is the hay. So you have an idea. Now, if your horse is out on free choice pasture or on round bales or free choice hay, it's really hard to weigh the hay. But especially if you're trying to really hone down on your feeding program, maybe you have an obese horse to take weight off, you have a young growing horse, uh, you have something medical going on that you need to really be careful about the nutrients. It really does help to, to weigh your hay so you know how much hay and how much feed they're getting to make sure that whole ration is as nutritionally perfect as you can get it to be. Okay, so you picked your feed, you've weighed your feed, you know how much you're going to feed to meet your horse's requirements. And then let's get into some feeding management. First, make sure, as I said before, that you meet the minimum recommended feeding rates. And if your horse is gaining too much weight on the minimum feeding rate, then look at going to a ration balancer. And you may, for a very easy keeper, you may have to uh, manage the forage intake either by limited grazing, uh, measuring your hay, possibly a grazing muzzle. Uh, next rule of thumb, feed small meals spaced regularly as much as possible. You think about horses, the horses in nature, they're out there grazing. They have access to food in their stomach pretty much all the time. Now they don't graze 100% of the time because sometimes they're moving, sometimes they're sleeping, but they have access pretty much all the time and that's really healthy for their gut. We usually don't have time to feed horses that way. So they often get fed in meals, but we wanna space the meals as evenly as possible through the day. And we wanna have smaller meals so we don't overload the horse's upper gut and get undigested meal into the hind gut uh, unless the feed is designed to be fed that way. So, but for typical horse feeds, the rule of thumb is no more than about half a pound per hundred pounds of body weight in a meal. 
So for a typical thousand pound horse, that's about five pounds of feed in a meal. If it's a lower sugar starch feed, you actually can feed a little more than that because the thing to worry about is getting an overload of sugar and starch from the upper gut into the horse's hind gut where it's fermented by the microbes. And if they get too much all, all at once, that can lead to colic and or laminitis. So small meals spaced frequently or spaced regularly through the day. Consistency is really important. Horses' uh, guts thrive on consistency. So anytime you have to make a change, make that change as gradually as possible. A small change in, in its ration, you can probably make in three to four days. A big change, you may wanna take 10 days up to two weeks to minimize the risk of digestive dis disturbances. And then as you're going along, even if your plan is working and things are great, continuously evaluate because things can change. You may get a different batch of hay and it's a different quality. You don't wanna get you know, slapped in the head and said, oh my gosh, I just noticed that my horse has, has lost a, an entire body condition score. So continuously evaluate. With my guys, I lay my hands on them at least three times a week in body condition score. The old man, every time I'm with him, I'm body condition scoring him because you want to make sure that your feeding program is still working because you may need to tweak it over time. Your horse changes, the forage changes. You just got to be aware. So you want to do regular body condition scoring, keep up with your veterinary exams and health practices, deworming, taking care of their teeth, all those things, vaccinations, make sure everything that goes along with keeping your horse healthy uh, is happening. And again, you may need to update as the horse's needs or your situation changes. So take home message, evaluate your horse to help determine its nutrient needs. Evaluate, be aware of the forage component of your horse's diet because that's a huge, huge component of the diet. Recognize and evaluate all the feeds, the supplements, if, if, well, figure out what you need and evaluate what's available to you. I don't wanna say all of them because again, your head might explode, but determine the best fit for you and your horse. And then management, manage your horse's total ration for the optimum results, feed the appropriate amounts by weight for your horse's body size and uh, their weight and their classification, what they're doing for a living and evaluate your horse and the ration on a regular basis to make sure that your horses are still be, horses needs are still being met. And for additional help, uh, www.ker.com at KER, we're, we're happy to help you. Uh, we're, we have access to the KER micro steed ration evaluation program, which is a wonderful program that helps evaluate the total nutrient content of your horse's diet. It does energy partitioning so we can figure out where the calories are coming from to really help you meet exactly what your horse's needs are at any given time for any classification of horse. And so the final take home message at KER, we do have, we have promotions every month. This month for April, um, Equisure and other, the other digestive health products are all 15% off. You can use the code DIGEST22 if you order from the KER website. Got to say they're great supplements. I, I use Equisure myself on, on uh, my younger guy with, to just keep the, the, the pH of his hindgut very consistent. It's really made a world of difference. I want to thank Ree Rasmussen and Britt Vegas Gengenbach for their friends and they allowed me to pilfer their Facebook pictures for this presentation to make sure I had plenty of um, good off track thoroughbred pictures. And I wanna thank y'all you for your time. And finally, if there are any questions, I would be happy, happy to, to answer or if we don't have time, you wanna send in questions, uh, we can get them and make sure we help you with anything you might need. We want to thank you for your time, Dr. Young. That was an awesome presentation, tons of information. Um, we do have some questions coming in. Um, we have a question on Facebook from Michaela. 
Um, this one's interesting. With state regulations, when you're talking about the regulated feed tags, you know, and what goes on those, um, do those apply to the state where the feed is produced or where it is sold? Great question, uh, where the feed is sold. So there are some feed companies that just have a, a few plants in the country. And, and I will say this is for the US, if by chance we have somebody from another country watching, each country has its own, its own regulations, but in the US, it's where it's sold. So sometimes it gets a little confusing, like California has a lot of their own specific regulations. And if a feed is produced, for instance, in the Midwest, but it is being shipped to California, a lot of times you'll see a feed tag that meets California requirements because they have more requirements, uh, but that feed actually may be sold in another state. And they're going, wait a minute, it's got all these extra guarantees. So uh, it, should, it should meet the requirements of the state in which, it, which it's sold, but it may have some extras on the tag if it's going to another state as well. So it meets multiple state requirements. Great question though. Yeah, that never occurred to me. So I'm glad she asked that. Um, we have another question. Anything else? Book. Yeah, a question from Liz. How long, this is a question I have too. How long should you give a new feed plan before you know if it's working or not? That, uh, another good question. Um, usually it's gonna take 60 to 90 days. Sometimes if, if it's a really big change and you've really um, upped your game on, on the, the total feeding program, you might see some differences in, in the shortest 30 days. But just really uh, give, you definitely, if, if, it's, if it's not improving in 30 days at all, and or things are going backwards, then reevaluate re -evaluate immediately. But again, some, some, some situations take 60 to 90 days to really see the full, the full effects, the full difference. That's one of the reasons we like to do this one in the spring. So anyone preparing a horse, especially for the makeover, makes sure you know they get their program right because you still have plenty of time to make this. Absolutely. Program. Yeah. And it's hard. It's hard to know, you know, because everyone wants to throw everything oh, yeah. in the kitchen sink at them and get them looking good, but it, it does yep. take full time. Yeah. Um, yes, it does. Other... And just real real quick, um, if you think about increasing their body weight, if you're wanting to put on body condition, every body can condition sport for about a 1,100 pound horse to put on a full body condition score is about 40 to 50 pounds of body weight. And uh, you, it's really pushing the envelope to, to try and put on any more than a pound a day. And usually I want to go a little slower because remember any big changes to horses can wreak havoc. So I like to go with a push for about a half a pound a day body weight gain. And so if you think about that, it's, it's going to take, you know, in, if you're doing half a pound a day, 60 days is 30 pounds. And that's not even quite, that's about half, half, not quite a full body condition score. So it's going to take a while. And if you're seeing the horse every day, you may not even see the difference, but that's when it's really helpful to get good at body condition scoring. So you can put your hands on them and say, oh yeah, I do. I feel a little bit more, a little more fat over the crest of the neck. I, I, can, I can feel over the top line and, and I can feel that my horse is laying on a little bit of fat. So that, that is very helpful, but yes, be, be, be a little patient. Which is hard to do. <laughs> I know it is. <laughs> you want to fix them today. Right. We have a question in Zoom from Allie. Uh, what tends to work the best for off-track thoroughbreds? Grain-based textured feeds, wheat middling based or alfalfa based pelleted feeds? You guys are coming up with some really good questions there. Okay, for, for putting weight on off-the-track thoroughbreds, first off, I like fat because fat is so calorie dense. And if it is a horse that tends to get a little bit more hyper on soluble carbs, fat, you don't see that with fat. That is not to say that you can't do a really great job with the grain-based feeds because the commercial grain-based feeds 
are not nearly as high starch and sugar as people usually think. As a matter of fact, a lot of the research that kind of is, is scary about non-structural carbs, for, for those research trials, they were feeding like straight corn, which corn is about 70% non-structural carbs. That's really high. Oats run about 50% or so non-structural carbs, but the typical sweet feeds on the market are at the highest about 45%. And then you, you get a, a sweet feed that's got a lot of beet pulp shreds, and that may be in the, in the low 30s for soluble carbs. So those, those feeds can be, especially some thoroughbreds can be very picky eaters. And in those situations, those, those sweet feeds that have a lot of fermentable fibers like the pulp, those can be really good options. Uh, but so either way, a, again, a pelleted feed, this kind of higher fat and fiber that's very palatable, those can be really good options to, to help put the weight on them or a, again, a sweet feed with a lot of fat in it. Is that, it's got lots of different things you can, you can opt for. Uh, one of my favorite feeds for off the track thoroughbreds to help them put on weight is uh, actually it's about eight to 10% fat. Uh, I do like pellets. Wheat mids are a great ingredient for these feeds. I, I don't mind. Wheat mids are kind of low to moderate insoluble carbs. Uh, one of the big things though is to make sure that that feed is highly fortified. It's got good quality protein, well fortified in vitamins and minerals, and finally really palatable for the horse because it's not doing you any good if half of the feed is left in the pan and your horse is sitting there going, hmm. That was not very exciting. I've got a bunch of questions coming in. I'm going to try to hit them all in order. Um, from Megan on Facebook. Do you have any suggestions okay. for reliable resources for maintenance amounts or maximum tolerable amounts of dietary components, such as magnesium or selenium? Yes, actually. Uh, the National Research Council puts out a publication Unfortunately, not often enough because it takes a huge amount of work for many equine nutritionists, but nutrient requirements of horses is, is kind of the gold standard that equine nutritionists use uh, for minimum requirements and also maximum tolerable amounts of, of uh, the nutrients to date. The, the last NRC was published in 2007 and Unfortunately, I'm not aware of uh, any plans for a new publication to be worked upon. There are some other resources. There are a lot of articles on the KER website to help give some information on nutrient requirements. Um, NRC does have a website that has kind of a, a little calculator that you can use I will say on that, it, it helps to work with an equine nutritionist because there's a lot of interpretation then when you just have the, the rough numbers to have a nutritionist who understands what all those things mean. There, uh, there are independent equine nutritionists out there that are available to, to help with interpreting numbers and uh, the requirements and the maximum tolerable amounts. So there's a lot of options, but you have to kind of sift through and try to find them. NRC, again, is, is the, the basic textbook. And then uh, Equine Clinical Nutrition who, that is edited by uh, Dr. Ray Gore and others is one of the most recent books that is available. It's very scientific and you really have to dig through. So if, if you really want to go that route, there, there are some options there. Did that answer the question, <laughs> Kristen? Or... Sounded good to me. I will let Megan okay. chime in if she has a follow-up. <laughs> but um, we have another question. That from... good. Yeah, that was like, that sounds great to me. <laughs> another question from Liz on Facebook. Um, if you have a horse that loses weight from traveling, should you be changing the feeding plan accordingly? 
Oh, gosh, another good question. Traveling is stressful on horses. And yeah, they it's, it's easy for them to lose weight. You really, it's, I, I would say it's even more stressful, though, to uh, be changing around the feeding program as well. There are several things that you can do to try and minimize that, that weight loss from stress. First off, dealing with the stress itself, try to keep things as normal as possible for the horse. So keep the feeding times, you know, as, as, as consistent as you possibly can. Uh, if your horse is not drinking, sometimes that, if they're not drinking enough in the traveling, then a lot of times if they're not drinking, then they back off on their feed. So sometimes carrying your own water with you, if you can, if not flavoring the water, uh, if you flavor the water at home so that they get used to it, and then you keep flavoring it on the road so the different water still tastes the same because it's flavored. You can use electrolytes for that. Some people suggested using like a little bit of Jello or a little bit of Gatorade or something to just kind of keep the water consistent. Uh, sometimes the stress is, can be related to gastric ulcers. So you can talk to your veterinarian about um, you know, using medications to help reduce the risk of ulcers. There are some good digestive aids. Uh, KER has got a couple supplements. Um, the Equisure as I mentioned, that's one that, the, that I use that is a, a buffer for the hindgut, but there's also Right Track, which has got buffering agents for the upper gut, including the stomach, it buffers the acid in the stomach, and then also has Equisure in it for the hindgut. But if you can buffer the acid in the stomach, that will reduce the risk of gastric ulcers. And um, another product that I actually like very much is called Hydration Hay. And it is often available at Tractor Supplies or you can get it online. A, a, a friend of mine actually bought uh, that, that formula, that product from uh, the company that started it. And uh, she, she now owns it. And it's, it's, it's a, a little hay, a two pound hay block that you add water up to five pounds of, of, of water and it, it absorbs the water. And then basically the horse uh, eats, they, it's very palatable and it eats the hay and water is absorbed into the hay. So it's basically eating its water and you can have this bucket and put it in your trailer and let your horse eat its water as it's down the road. And that's, that's really been shown to help reduce the stress in the trailer. So any of these things that you can do to make sure that they're hydrated, uh, make sure things are consistent, make sure that the, the stomach is buffered so that they they have less risk of uh, gastric ulcers as they go down the road. Those, those may help, but I do know traveling is hard for horses. So anything you can do to reduce that stress for them uh, can be helpful. Lots of information there. We have a few more questions in on uh, Zoom. Um, is feeding five plus pounds of grain an issue? And I'm assuming that Lainey here means all in one feeding as opposed to split up over multiple feedings. It, it depends on the, first off the size of the horse. And then it really, that, that's just the rule of thumb. Because if you're feeding a lower starch a feed, that 0.5% that, uh, of their body weight really uh, addresses the amount of starch it takes to overload the horse's upper gut, upper gut and get undigested starch in the hind gut. So if your horse, if your horse uh, is like insulin resistant, then you got to really be careful about the amount of soluble carbs in the meal. If the horse is not insulin resistant, then if you've got a moderate starch feed there, if, if the feeds, you know, in the 20 to 30% non-structural carbs, carbs by calculation, you can actually, and for a thousand pound horse, you can usually feed like about eight pounds in a meal without overloading the upper gut. And if it's a really low starch feed, 
Uh, some of them I calculated, you can feed like 12 pounds in a meal. And, but if you're having to feed 12 pounds of feed in a meal, uh, you might want to look at what feed you're feeding. You might want to be looking at a higher calorie feed so you don't have to feed that much in a meal. But so it, it's really variable, but if it's, got, if, it's, if it's a traditional sweet feed that's just corn, oats, molasses, and then maybe a pellet with some protein, vitamins, and minerals, for that type of feed, 1,000 pound horse, you yeah, have five pounds, maybe six maximum in a meal. Now you can feed more meals. You can feed two meals a day. If you've got a really hard keeper, you can feed three meals a day. That's just the amount you want to watch those maximums per meal. All right, a uh, couple questions. Let's see, Wendy would like to know um, if I want to add some fat to the diet, what kinds of oil can I use, if oils at all? There's lots of different oils. Uh, fat, fats are kind of fats. They're, they're all high calorie. I, it depends on your goal. If you're just wanting to add calories, then uh, the, the vegetable fats pretty much are all the, very similar in calories. If you're looking for something like omega-3 fatty acids, then the fats are very different. Uh, corn oil really doesn't, is not a good source of omega-3s. Um, Soy oil is a reasonable source of omega-3s. Uh, fish oil is actually the best source of omega-3s. However, my recommendation for adding fat, because when adding fat, other than the fatty acids and the calories, you're just adding fat and diluting out all the other nutrients you may be feeding. So I usually recommend rather than just top dressing fat on the feed is looking for a feed that has more fat incorporated into the feed because then all the other nutrient balances are formulated to go along with that higher calorie. As I said, a as a nutritionist, we look at nutrient to calorie ratios to make sure that those are correct in the feed. And it's pretty easy these days to find feeds that are at least 6% fat there's a lot of very palatable 8% fat feeds. And I've seen really good quality feeds that are 12 and, you know, 12 plus percent fat. So you can get the fat that is actually in the feed. Uh, again, if you want the omega-3s and you want to just top dress for, for that benefit, fish oil is your best bet. And KER does have an excellent supplement, it's called EO3, and it's, it's, it's fish oil based and it's a very great source of omega-3 fatty acids. And for, it's, it's amazingly palatable because when fish oils were first coming out, man, horses would just turn their no noses up. Uh, but the EO3 has, has gone through reformulation so that it is, it is quite palatable for horses probably not as palatable as like giving them a carrot, but very few things are. So yeah, EO3 has been really great for, you know, top dressing on feed to really bump up the, it gets a little bit more fat in them, but really bumps up the omega-3 content if that's, if that's the goal. All right, we have two questions left on Zoom and I'm gonna cut questions off so we can let Dr. Young go this evening and enjoy the rest of her night. Um, we have a question for Edie. My five-year-old is starting to show signs of laminitis, possibly EMS or something related. Uh, the vet can't come out for blood tests until the end of May. Is a ration balancer the best way to go? And if so, what percentage of sugars or starches should she stay under? Okay, that's a tough one. And that's, that's a situation where I'd have a lot more questions, but I'm going to answer it generally. Okay, if your horse is... If, if your horse is starting to show signs of laminitis, the first thing to look at is the primary source of sugars in the diet. If the horse is on pasture, you probably wanna pull it off the pasture and get it on a hay that's gonna be lower in soluble carbs, which the cool season grass hays tend to be higher in soluble carbs. The warm season grass hays tend to be lower. And the ones that are usually available, if you're in the South, Coastal Bermuda grass, you want good quality coastal Bermuda grass, but that tends to be low in soluble carbs. And then a lot of places now you can get that teff grass, which is related to Bermuda grass. 
and that tends to be low in soluble carbs, but that's the first place to look at whether it's metabolic syndrome or any other of the myriad causes. I, I did a webinar uh, earlier today on the dealing with the, the flush of spring grass. So again, this is a high risk time for laminitis for horses on grass. So get them off the grass, uh, get the laminitis resolved. And if it's an easy keeper and will maintain body weight and body condition on, on, the, on the hay, on a low soluble carb hay, then yeah, ration balancer might be a really good way to go. Uh, because ration balancers are usually low, very low in at most moderate soluble carb, but usually they're very low. And then that low feeding rate in grams per day, they're not getting a lot of soluble carbs. So that might be a good way to go or look for a feed that is low sugar starch and um, moderate in calories. Because if, if it's metabolic syndrome and the horse is becoming laminitic because it's overweight, then you want to start dieting them. So again, lower soluble carb forage and also a lower calorie, low soluble carb feed or ration balancer. But yeah, get with your vet. And if, if the horse is sore, figure out what's causing it, but get them off as much soluble carb. When you ask the maximum amount of soluble carb that's a hard one because research really has not determined how low you can go without going too low. In general, the recommendation is in the, the, in the total diet, 10 to 12% non-structural carbs, and that's the forage and the feed part of the diet. So that, that's kind of a basic place to, to start. Again, uh, for your horse, if, if you want to give us a shout at ker.com, uh, we'll try and work with you individually and, and your veterinarian to help get you where you really need to be to manage this. All right, our last question of the night. This one might be fun. How many calories does a pound of rice bran add to a feeding? Tell me if you can do that math really fast. Um, actually, rice bran is not as high as we usually, as we used to, well, as, as many people think. I'm thinking it's about 1,200 or thereabouts kilocalorie per pound, but it really depends too because um, different sources of rice bran can be different. Um, and I just, I do want to throw out there. People have this idea that rice bran is low in soluble carbs, and it's not necessarily. It's, it, it, it's variable, but it's a reasonable source of fat, and it's, it's kind of a moderate source of soluble carbs, and it's not a source of omega-3s. So rice bran is one of those things that it can be really good in a feed as an ingredient, but it's not something that I usually recommend as a supplement. But if you do want to top dress with rice bran, make sure number one, it's a, it's a stabilized rice bran because if it's not stabilized, it gets rancid very quickly and horses hate rancidity. It's, it's not good. And number two, rice bran uh, tends to be very inverted in its calcium phosphorus ratio. So you wanna make sure that your rice bran supplement is one of them that does have a balanced calcium phosphorus ratio which is usually around two to one calcium to phosphorus. So, all right. More information than probably anybody wanted about rice bran. <laughs> it's good to know. <laughs> I fed it for a while and then kind of got away from it. And sounds like maybe that was a, a decent move. So, <laughs> so, well, thanks oh, very much, Dr. Young. Problems. Super there, information. <laughs> Um, I think we've answered a lot of questions. There's lots of thank yous coming through as well. So thank you so much for your time. Um, if people oh, no, still have questions, if they're watching this a day later, where can they go to find more information or to ask a question again? I don't know if my internet might've died on you or not, but.
Um, you just you just came back. Oh, I'm back. All right. If folks are You're watching back. this again uh, a day later on demand, where can they go to have more questions answered or to ask a question? Uh, KER.com. All right. All right, everyone. Well, thank you so much for coming and hanging out with us tonight. Um, if you're watching this on demand, certainly uh, send questions into KER. Um, and thanks again for joining us. Thank you much.